Thank you very much. Um, so we're here to talk about the mesentery, congenital and acquired disorders of a new organ. Um, and you know what the mesentery is, I know what the mesentery is, probably even some of the medical students here know what the mesentery is. Um, but The Independent earlier this year uh, released this, the mesentery new organ discovered inside the human body by scientists. And now there are 79 of them. The finding opens up a whole new area of science. Um, so I suppose we should call it organ number 79. CNN covered it. The mesentery is a new organ you didn't know you had. Um, and of course, BBC News uh, labelled it a new organ named in the digestive system. Doctors have always known about the mesentery, but it has now been classified as the 79th organ in the body. Um, and they, it was published in The Lancet, all this research. And my favourite journal, sorry, magazine, Cosmopolitan, love, celebs, beauty, style, escapes, and everything you need to know about the mesentery, the new organ discovered inside the human body. Um, so we know it's been there all along, but now it should be reclassified, and today's talk is really a little bit about the importance of the mesentery, the disorders um, associated with it, and um, my colleagues are going to present some of that to you, and then I'll see you later for the science part. Okay, I'm just going to present a, a case uh, involving the mesentery. Um, this was referred to me a couple of years ago uh, by one of the retired professors of the Royal College of Surgeons who phoned me one evening to say, could I see his uh, niece? And I can tell you that's a much more efficient method of referral than the, the two-week wait system. Um, anyway, uh, his niece was, uh, or is, uh, an 85-year-old lady. Uh, she'd had an umbilical hernia repair as a neonate, and she'd been well throughout the rest of her childhood uh, but from about the age of 24, she'd had intermittent episodes of obstructive symptoms, characterised by colicky pain, vomiting, abdominal distension and constipation. And these episodes basically resolved fairly rapidly, 24, 48 hours, with no major intervention. She'd had two significant episodes uh, between the ages of 24 and her mid-50s. But over the previous, previous four months, uh, she'd had three episodes, they were becoming more frequent, and the episodes were becoming more severe. Up to this point, they'd all been managed conservatively, uh, but she was clearly reaching a, a bit of a crisis point. Examination in clinic was pretty unremarkable. There was a scar from a previous umbilical operation, but otherwise essentially normal. Uh, a plain x-ray uh, in clinic didn't show anything drastic, perhaps with... Uh, sort of hindsight, there may be some prominent loops of bowel in the centre of the abdomen, but nothing too drastic. So we arranged fairly quickly to get a CT scan of the abdomen, and that showed a much more obviously dilated segment of bowel, not completely clear uh, which bit of bowel, um, and I think you can probably agree a sort of swirling appearance of the, uh, the small bowel mesentery. So our thought was that she uh, probably had uh, some form of volvulus, some sort of form of intermittent twisting of the mesentery. So she underwent uh, a laparoscopy, which there were some adhesions to the umbilical area, but otherwise nothing very much. Uh, and we fairly rapidly proceeded to a small midline incision. Uh, and the, the dominant finding, so I should have gone to this, um, Essentially, through a small midline incision, the whole of the, the right colon sort of flopped out into the, the, the wound. And you can see here an extremely mobile cecum. This is the terminal ilium. This is the uh, sort of what should be the ascending and the transverse colon. This is up towards the head end. This is down towards the, the legs. And essentially, all of the colon was to the patient's left side, that's the far side as we look at, look at it, and all of the small bowel was to the right side. But the really striking thing was this, this massively mobile bowel which just flopped out into the wound with no, no surgical mobilization whatsoever. When we looked a bit more closely, you can see some nodules on here affecting the, the small bowel uh, and a couple of other slightly puckered nodules. 
uh, affecting the, uh, the area around the Isle of Seagull Junction and the distal small bow. Um, so at, that, at this stage, we weren't completely sure what was going on. I wondered, is this malignancy? or is this a, a very mobile uh, cecum with intermittent volvulus? So essentially did a right hemicolectomy, removing all the, the very redundant uh, floppy bowel with a long mesentery and incorporating most of these nodules that we were a little bit concerned about. She made a good recovery. Unfortunately, all of the pathology reports were benign, just some fibrous scarring. And essentially, she's been completely fine ever since. Um, and what we sort of didn't, it wasn't completely clear, but essentially she had a complete malrotation of the bowel, the whole of the colon to the left side, the whole of the small bowel to the right side. And she was, in hindsight, almost certainly getting partial twists of her floppy bowel, untwisting and then uh, rec re recovering. But having removed that redundant bowel, she seemed to uh, recover. So I'm just going to run through a little bit about the, the embryology of the, the small bowel and the, the, what the normal rotation of the small bowel should be. As I'm sure you remember, during embryological development, uh, the gut is outside of the abdominal cavity. And then between the fifth and 10th week, the bowel returns to inside the abdominal cavity and undergoes a, a rotation of 270 degrees anti-clockwise, which is kind of, I think, quite difficult to understand. This diagram is supposed to show the bowel, which is a sort of tube from stomach, duodenum, and the whole of the midgut, which is supplied by the supramesenteric vessels uh, goes outside of the abdomen. This is the mesentery with the blood vessels supplying the midgut, uh, including the right side of the colon. This goes back into the abdomen in early embryological development, and then in a stepwise fashion undergoes a rotation. So if you could imagine looking at me at the bowel, the, the uh, cecum is down here in the left abdomen, and the duodenum here, essentially, the bowel undergoes a three-quarter, 270-degree rotation, where the cecum moves from here upwards, across, and then down to the right iliac fossa, where it should live. And meanwhile, the duodenum, the DJ Fletcher, moves slightly from the right side towards the left side. So it ends up in the normal anatomical configuration with the DJ Fletcher slightly to the left side and the cecum down in the right islet fossa, and then the ascending colon fuses to the, to the back of the abdominal wall to become a retroperitoneal structure, and the descending colon on the left side fuses to become retroperitoneal. So that's what should happen, but of course doesn't always happen. And just diagrammatically, this is showing the, the mesentery outside the start of the rotation with the cecum and ascending colon rotating upwards, then it rotates across, and finally comes down and finishes down here in the correct orientation. Um, so a complete malrotation is when none of that happens, and the cecum and the colon remain on the left side of the abdomen, and the whole of the small bowel is on the right side of the abdomen. And that's exactly what we found with this lady. Um, the big problem with this is that you end up with a short mesentery. Uh, so here's what uh, is happening. The, the cecum stays here and doesn't rotate round like that. So that's the general appearance of a complete malrotation of the bowel. Um, and it's pretty rare for that to not cause many symptoms into late adult life. Then there are numerous variations of partial malrotation, depending, if you like, on how far round that rotation gets. Um, and how far or how far it doesn't get. So the, the sort of key clues to a malrotation are that the cecum is not in the correct place and will typically be high up underneath the uh, liver. As a result of that, the cecum and the DJ flexure and, and the duodenum are close, and you can get compression by adhesions between the duodenum and the colon. And the other key feature is that the DJ flexure remains on the right side of the abdomen and hasn't rotated correctly to the left side. 
And the, the problem with the partial malrotations is that the start of the small bowel, the DJ flexure, and the cecum are too close together. So you then have a very mar narrow mesentery, which is much more likely to rotate. If the root of the mesentery is far apart, sort of here and here, it's much more stable, supports the small bowel, and doesn't allow it to rotate. If the two are sort of much closer together, then clearly a twist off the mesentery is much more likely. Oops. Um, so in summary, it's a pretty rare problem seen far more commonly by pediatric surgeons. Uh, apparently, the average adult GI surgeon will only see one case uh, of malrotation in his or her career. Uh, and, therefore, and so adult surgeons are not really geared up to diagnosing this. Um, and the case, patients tend to present with slightly more vague symptoms rather than the clear-cut obstruction which this lady had. Uh, the, the presentations are, as you might expect, acutely as a sudden volvulus, uh, which would look something like this with the small bowel twisting around. And it's one of the causes of catastrophic loss of all of the small bowel, ending up with people needing long-term nutritional support. Um, to investigate electively, uh, CT scan is the, the key investigation. Contrast studies, not done quite so much today, but uh, you can see here the, the cecum in a very abnormal position high up in the uh, subhepatic region. So that's a, it's kind of rotated uh, 180 degrees rather than the full 270 degrees counterclockwise. The CT scan findings that will help you identify this uh, are shown here. You can see uh, the cecum uh, still on the left side of the abdomen and the terminal ileum here in the wrong position to the, to the right side. Um, most of the small bowel on the wrong side of the abdomen. If there is a twist, you get this sort of whirling appearance of the vessels in the mesentery. Uh, the absolutely diagnostic feature is that the duodenum, the DJ flexor, remains completely on the right side and hasn't rotated round to the left side of the midline. If you're a very good radiologist, you can identify that the superior mesenteric, ar mesenteric artery and vein are in the incorrect uh, orientation to one another. Um, and the surgical treatment is pretty difficult. Um, the pediatric surgeons are much more used to this, but the principles are basically to put the bowel into either the completely rotated position or more usually to put into the completely unrotated position. So, uh, so go back into a total malrotation, which will involve, involve freeing up the cecum, dividing the so-called bands of land, uh, lad that are tethering uh, the bowel in that area, uh, and if necessary, taking out the appendix, which would be a difficult appendicectomy if it did come to that. Uh, diagrammatically, you can see a malrotation being put back into the totally malrotated position. So in summary, it's a rare condition. Adult surgeons do need to be aware of it. Uh, the surgery is challenging, and phoning a friend, usually a pediatric surgeon, is particularly helpful. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'm Kalle Landerholm, um, and I'm very honored to be a clinical fellow here and also honored to talk to you today about, the, um, uh, about Crohn's disease and more specifically about the role of the mesentery in Crohn's disease and whether it is possibly time to think differently about surgery for this disease. Uh, I will first illustrate quite severe Crohn's disease with a case, and after that I will talk about recent insights uh, when it comes to Crohn's and the mesentery. So Sarah was born in 1985 and diagnosed with ileocecal Crohn's disease at age 14. She was treated with prednisolone and azathioprine during her first years and later with various biologics. Her first operation was in 2004 when she had a laparoscopic ileocecal resection. Uh, she also had segments with milder uh, Crohn's disease in the jejunum that was uh, left. Um, Four years later, she had developed uh, perineal disease with fistulae. Uh, she was also suffering from obstructive symptoms from a recurrent stricture of the ileocolic anastomosis. And she was again operated laparoscopically uh, 
with resection of the strictured anastomosis and also um, an end ileostomy. Three years further on in 2011, she was again suffering from obstructive symptoms and needed further surgery. Um, at laparotomy, um, uh, multiple strictures were found and they were treated with one resection and four stricture plasters were performed as well. Uh, and this is to illustrate the segment that would have been resected, whereas uh, this shows an isolated shorter stricture which would have been amenable to stricture plasty. In 2012 she was suffering from Crohn's colitis and from her perineal fistulating disease and she underwent a pond proctocolectomy and this would not have been the whole specimen, as you can't see the rectum here. Unfortunately, she had a breakdown of the perineal wound, and uh, that resulted in a chronic wound cavity and a new fistula, vaginal fistula. And her most recent procedure was last year for a mesenteric abscess. Uh, no resection was made during this operation. But nevertheless, she is left with no colon and um, only 170 centimeters of small bowel with remaining disease in it. And as a result, she has intestinal failure and is dependent on home TPM. So with this case as a background, I will now move on to the role of the mesentery in Crohn's disease. Uh, as you heard a little bit about before, it has recently been acknowledged that the mesentery is an active player with regulatory functions, both locally and systemically. Uh, it also behaves like the omentum to wall off perito uh, intraperitoneal inflammation, uh, perhaps as in Sarah's case with the abscess. It is also involved in reparative activities, and these functions are probably of importance both in health and in disease. Uh, hallmarks of Crohn's disease include mucosal inflammation and ulceration, fat wrapping, which is unique to Crohn's disease, uh, thickened and foreshortened mesentery, stricturing of the bowel lumen, and perforating disease with abscesses and fistulae. <coughs> and the mesenteric characteristics were acknowledged by already by Crohn himself more than 80 years ago, so that is no novelty. But the timing of events in Crohn's disease pathology is a current source of debate. And the question is uh, if the mesenteric pathology is the hen or the egg. The traditional view has been that uh, inflammatory bowel disease arises in the intestinal mucosa as a result of an abnormal interplay between luminal bacteria and the immune response in the setting of genetic and environmental factors. Uh, the pathology of the mesentery has then been regarded as a secondary process. But in light of recent findings, this outside-in model has been questioned and an alternative inside-out model has been proposed. Uh, and according to this alternative theory, the mesentery is involved at a much earlier stage, and the initial steps may actually occur within the mesentery and then involves the mucosa. Uh, one finding in support of the inside-out model is that MRI studies found mesenteric abnormality earlier than previously thought, uh, actually before there were any signs of mucosal disease on endoscopy. Uh, in Crohn's disease and in other inflammation, inflammatory cells produce an array of cytokines and pro-inflammatory mediators. It has recently been found that the fat cells, the adipocytes, uh, in the mesentery play a vital role in this. And they are uh, able to phagocytose bacteria translocated to the mesentery. Uh, they secrete cytokines, but also has been found to uh, been major contributors to the systemic CRP levels in Crohn's disease. Uh, 
It is believed that the inflammation in Crohn's attracts circulating fibrocytes, which are neutrophils with the potential to differentiate uh, into fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, which may contribute to stricturing, among other processes. And they also mature into adipocytes, adding to mesenteric adipocyte hyperplasia. Uh, at the microscopic level, uh, prominent features of Crohn's disease include adipocyte hyperplasia and connective tissue thickening. And the pattern uh, is similar both in submucosa and in the mesentery. And it could uh, therefore be that the transmural disease uh, often seen is not mucosal uh, disease extending very deep, but rather pathology from within and from without, sandwiching the intestinal wall. Uh, and supporting this, the worst inflammation and ulceration is typically seen on the mesenteric border of the circumference and not elsewhere. Still at the microscopic level, other features of the mesentery in Crohn's include loss of autonomic nerves and angiogenesis. Uh, obstruction of lymphatic vessels uh, results in submucosal edema, uh, which in turn results in hypoxia and in increased inflammation and fibrosis. So the end result uh, is a much thickened and fatty mesentery uh, with four times the number of adipocytes, although each cell much smaller in size than normally. There are more inflammatory cells, nerves are affected, there's an increase of blood vessels, and lymphatic drainage is blocked with the edema as a result. And then there's the characteristic creeping factor, fat wrapping. Uh, moving on to the macroscopic features of the mesentery in Crohn's disease. Typically, the localization of the mesenteric signs of disease correspond well to the extent of mucosal disease, uh, as illustrated in this image A and B. Uh, with the traditional view, this has been regarded as mesenteric pathology being secondary to the mucosa, uh, but it could perhaps be the other way around. Uh, supporting the new inside-out theory, or at least that the mesentery are involved in, uh, is, uh, is involved in uh, pathologic pro uh, the pathologic process. Uh, the drawing also highlights that uh, the ulceration in the mucosa occurs primarily on the mesenteric aspect uh, of the luminal circumference, as I mentioned before. Um, and another finding pointed out by Professor Coffey is that Crohn's disease most commonly occur in the ileocecal region, uh, which happens to be the largest portion of mesentery in the body. Second most common is Crohn's colitis, again coinciding with more voluminous uh, mesentery. So the mesentery uh, appears to have a central role in Crohn's disease. And this new insight opens up for clinically oriented research focused both on diagnostics and treatment. The mesentery is presently inaccessible other than during surgery and can only be assessed by indirect signs such as the uh, comb sign on CT or MRI. Uh, but perhaps focused investigation of the mesentery will prove both feasible and helpful in the future both endoscopic visualization and transluminal uh, mesenteric biopsies have been suggested to achieve that. And with the acknowledgement of mesenteric pathology comes new prospects also for treatment, both pharmacologically and surgically. Infliximab is already known to have at least some of its effect in the mesentery and other substances could follow. And uh, regarding surgery, about uh, around 80% of uh, Crohn's patients will need at least one abdominal operation for the disease, and around 40% of them will require further surgery. Uh, this has remained largely unchanged for several decades despite modern medical treatment. Um, a lot of effort has been put into improving uh, these figures, both in medical treatment uh, to keep patients in remission and with surgical techniques. Uh, 
there was a period when wider radical excision was thought to give a better outcome. Uh, but it was later found that resection margins wider than removing the macroscopic disease was not beneficial. Uh, and in Crohn's disease, preserving bowel length um, is crucial to avoid short bowel syndrome in the long run, as illustrated by Sarah's case. Uh, but the focus has been on the longitudinal resections, uh, resection margins, uh, and not on the circumferential, which is equally important in uh, cancer surgery or oncological resections. Uh, by contrast, in surgery for Crohn's disease, the standard is to divide the mesentery close to the intestine, uh, much owing to the risk of bleeding when dealing with bul bulky and inflamed fatty tissue. Um, however, if the mesentery is part of the disease, or possibly even the hotspot for it, it would maybe be time for a new surgical approach, perhaps. In support of that, Lee et al. found that high levels of visceral fat is predictive of endoscopic recurrence. And Coffey et al. reports unpublished data so far showing a dramatically lower risk of reoperation after oncologic type resections, 2.7 instead of 27% uh, after conventional resection. So I'm sure that we will hear more about this in the future. Thank you. Okay, good morning. So uh, I'll, uh, I'd like to start my uh, presentation with a case of a 22-year-old male who presents himself with uh, symptoms of slowly intermittent progressive uh, stove obstruction. His uh, medical history was uh, unremarkable, apart from uh, familial adenomatous uh, polyposis of the colon, for which he was on a regular endoscopic follow-up. Uh, on clinical examination, his abdomen was non-tender and non-distended, uh, but a mass could be felt in the mesogastrium. The lab test was uh, unremarkable, and the CT result, which showed this, it doesn't show anything, yeah. So the CT report came back as uh, a mesenteric infiltrative uh, mass. And then next the patient asked, doctor, what is it? What can be done about it? And is it serious? Well, I'm going to talk about uh, desmoid tumors. They're also known as uh, aggressive fibromatosis or deep muscle aponeurotic fibromatosis. And uh, these are the topics which I will uh, elaborate upon uh, later on in this talk. To get started with the definition, uh, it is derived from Greek, desmos, because of its bent or tendon-like appearance. It is known to be locally aggressive, but without any uh, potential for metastatic disease or risk for dedifferentiation. It has a high recurrence rate, even after complete resection, and this is especially the case in uh, FAP patients. Epidemiology-wise, it's quite a rare disorder. Only about 0.03% of all neoplasms are uh, desmoids, and even in the subgroup of uh, soft tissue tumors, it's uh, quite a rare disease. In the whole of the UK, I guess there is only about 200 patients a year that uh, emerge. Usually the patients are a bit younger, so 15 to 60 years of age, and there is a female predominance without any racial uh, preference. You could ask yourself, am I at risk? Well, there is a risk, but it's quite small, because most of the uh, desmoids appear to um, develop spontaneous. Nonetheless, the association with FAP is uh, quite known, uh, and it's uh, even called a uh, syndrome, um, Gardner syndrome. So uh, FAP patients have a predominant risk of uh, 852 times that of the normal population to develop desmoid tumors. There is even a higher risk if there is a familial history of it, and depending on the location of the mutation of the APC gene. Gardner syndrome is also associated uh, with dermoid cysts and osteomas, and the desmoids are usually located intra-abdominally in the abdominal wall, 
tend to recur quite easily, as, also, as has already been said, and uh, they are usually also multiple locations. Pregnancy is also a risk factor. It is due to the increased levels of oestrogen during the pregnancy, uh, which allow the desmoid to grow. But if a desmoid is present prior to the pregnancy, it doesn't mean that it has to grow. It's just more likely to do so. If it would have been resected after previous pregnancy, uh, there is no bigger chance uh, to have recurrence during the next pregnancy. And overall, luckily, the risk for the pregnancy itself is quite minimal. If we want to take out the desmoid, we are in inadvertently already inflicting one of the new risk factors, namely surgery or trauma, uh, which tends to cause a new resurgence of uh, desmoids. So it's a bit a catch 69 or 22. Um, so the um, molecular pathogenesis is actually not well understood. Uh, we know from uh, molecular studies that there are some lesions that uh, show a clonal chromosomal change of a tri trisomy of uh, chromosome 8 and 20, but most likely it is due to dysregulation of the wound healing um, and all the uh, pathways in between, which is usually the WNT beta catenin pathway, uh, in which several proteins interfere, as well the APC protein, um, which is also um, one of the causes of the FAP pathology. Uh, which normally uh, phosphorylates the beta catenin and therefore it is destroyed afterwards. So if there is no phosphorylation, the levels of beta catenin tend to arise into the cell and uh, they cause prolonged cell, uh, yeah, prolonged cell life and increased proliferation. The symptoms of uh, desmoids are actually quite minimal. They are usually quite deeply located and are pokey symptomatic. Where can they arise? Well, virtually anywhere. But depending on uh, the type, uh, there is a predominance for FAP uh, patients to have them within the uh, intra-abdominal or in the abdominal wall. There are also some locations in the breast, uh, and otherwise they're mainly located at the trunk, uh, so shoulder girdle, hip, and buttock. How is the lesion diagnosed? Well, normally, and the easiest way to do so is uh, using MRI. Unfortunately, there is no reliable characteristic, characteristic to distinguish it from a sarcoma. On T1, it's hyper to iso intense to muscle, and on T2, it's hyper intense with some hyper intense regions due to the collagen uh, collections. When added gadolinium, it, uh, it starts to be moderate to market enhanced with again the hyper intense bands because the collagen doesn't uh, well absorb the gadolinium. Ultrasound can be done as well, but it's quite a specific and it's usually only used for quite superficial lesions to follow them up. In uh, several articles, it was mentioned that it might be sensible to do an endoscopy in those patients because 5 to 6 percent of all desmoid patients also uh, seem to have uh, FAB disease. So by diagnosing the one, you could also diagnose the other. Histologically, it is a monoclonal fibroblastic uh, proliferation with uh, low cellularity and the cells that are present are usually at the peripheral side of the desmoid, which differentiates from uh, sarcoma because of its, uh, in, in desmoids there are a low level of mitotic figures and there is no necrosis. Even easier to diagnose is the immunohistochemistry. Because of the nuclear beta-catenin uh, collections, it uh, is quite avidly shown uh, on a stain for that. Uh, medicine always moves forward, so next generation sequencing can also be used, but this is more specific, specifically used to diagnose specific muta mutations in uh, several of the pathways. What can be done to treat the disease? Well, that all depends a bit on the location. Uh, in literature, it is more or less divided into treatment of intra disease and disease by desmoids elsewhere. Also, the expected success of the treatment can, uh, can change your decision. So it's either completely resectable, resectable with, with remarkable morbidity, unremarkable, unresectable, or, um, and you should always be in mind as well for the recurrence risk. Several options are present, and I'll elaborate on those. Wait and see. 
as there are no evidence-based medicine guidelines uh, to treat desmoids, anything can be used, any treatment can be used, uh, but it is common practice to wait, watch and wait, uh, wait and see, sorry, um, in, in case of desmoids, especially if they're stable, asymptomatic, and if they're intra-abdominally located. Local therapy is also quite often used, and surgery is one of the main treatment options then. Uh, one of the dogmas in oncological surgery is that you should resect the lesion, lesion, lesion with an R-naught resection. Unfortunately, it has been shown that even in an R-naught resection of a desmoid, there is a chance of recurrence. This is especially so in intra-abdominal desmoids, um, due to their infiltrative nature uh, of about 95% of all intra-abdominal desmoids and is not really well understood. The other possibility for local therapy is radiation therapy and that is usually used for patients who have declined surgery who are, not, who are not good candidates for surgery or who have high surgical morbidity. It can also be used as a step-up procedure for surgery preoperatively to downsize the lesion or postoperatively, if there has been an R1 or R2 resection, or even if it was an R0 resection uh, with a large tumor. Usually a quite high dose of 50 to 60 gray in several sessions over five to seven weeks is used. You should be mindful that the time for regression of the lesion tends to be quite long due to its low proliferation, proliferation rate. And there is quite high risk for secondary malignancy, especially in young patients who have been, uh, who have been receiving radi radiation therapy. Adding on to the fibrosis due to, due to the desmoid, uh, radiation will also cause uh, additional fibrosis. Next, there is a possibility for systemic therapy. This is a flowchart which has been uh, advocated by the MD, MD Anderson Cancer Center in which they divide the population into two groups, the high risk and the low risk. High risk are people with, uh, high, so with quick growth uh, of their lesions with our, which are unresectable, or with uh, symptomatic slow growth uh, which of lesions which are not responding to alternative uh, treatment regimens. <coughs> Sorry. The systemic therapy is usually div divided into three groups. The non-cytotoxic drug regimens, which are usually based on NSAIDs or anti-hormonal anti uh, therapy, to, uh, namely on uh, estrogen selective receptor uh, blockers. If, they, if they, those don't respond, they usually progress to targeted therapy, uh, imatinib. And if that doesn't work, then there are cytotoxic drugs, and usually one of those two regimens is used. The upper one is used in six or eight cycles, and uh, the lower one is usually used for a year as it is less toxic. Recurrence risk is quite high, and it's depending on several factors. So depending on the site, you might have an increased risk. Bigger lesions, female gender, and younger age are all predisponents for recurrence. Whether or not positive resection margins might give increased chance of recurrence is still debatable, but if possible, an R0 resection is also always preferred. Prognosis. This is actually quite interesting. If you see that the prognosis, the five-year prognosis of the lesions is quite for, for variable, even if it is not treated, and you can see here that one-fifth will regress spontaneously, one-fifth will progress, and the majority will stabilize. A study from the Cleveland Clinic uh, showed that uh, if you try to divide all the patients into three different groups, uh, in, into four different groups based on uh, three topics, namely symptoms, size, and growth, uh, then they could see that, the, uh, depending on the stage, there is none or 25 risk of demise in the five-year follow-up period. And the <coughs> one period with uh, stage one died from other causes. Even if the lesion has been completely resected or after treatment, it's very important to follow the patient up. Fortunately, there are no evidence-based guidelines, but there is a consensus post, uh, posted by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which states that you should follow up the patient quite closely for the three to, every three to six months for the first two to three years, and annually afterwards. <coughs> 
doing so by clinical exams and radiographic studies. What will I hope that you take away from this meeting? Um, what is desmoid? Well, it is locally aggressive monoclonal fibroblast proliferation without any risk for metastatic disease or dedifferentiation. It can occur almost anywhere, but predominantly in the abdomen. And how can you treat it? Several possibilities, but usually it's multimodal. Depending, you can start with wait and see or with uh, some systemic therapy, and if possible, for local resection or radiation therapy, that can be done as well. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you to my colleagues. I hope they've managed to convince you that the mesentery is the root of all evil and certainly not as innocent as we all thought. Um, so I'm going to unpick. Um, the sort of the science behind all the headlines um, and sorry for all the ladies out there but it's a very male dominated um, sort of uh, presentation so this is the first man to document the mesentery um, anyone know who he is it's uh, Leonardo da Vinci and he um, documented sort of centuries ago that the mesentery was continuous, uh, which is an important concept I'll come back to later, and that it appeared to converge centrally. So he essentially identified a route, and his drawings, if you look at them, do depict uh, that the mesentery extends from the small intestine right down to the mesorectum. Uh, so the second chap, any takers for this one? It's very famous, so turn of the century surgeon, Sir Frederick Treves. So for all the budding surgeons out there, if you're ever asked who somebody is, it's usually a turn of the century surgeon. Um, and it's him we have to thank for making the appendicectomy mainstream in England. He was surgeon to Queen Victoria, I think he was called Surgeon Extraordinaire, and to King Edward, her son. And he famously drained the appendix abscess of King Edward, delaying the coronation by two days. Um, but following that, appendix surgery entered mainstream, um, sort of main, it became mainstream in the UK. He also um, found the elephant man, discovered him outside the Royal London Hospital and took him into the London Hospital where he remained for the entirety of his life. Um, but we digress slightly and he famously documented the mesentery and he studied 100 cadavers in, and presented his findings to the Royal College of Surgeons and he actually is famous for coining the term the root of the mesentery. But he said that the mesentery was only present at the small intestine, transverse colon, and sigmoid colon. Oh, this is his book on the elephant man, uh, which makes for good reading. So this is his famous um, British Medical Journal paper in 1886, very interesting reading, um, where he documents his drawings of the mesentery and of his 100 cadavers, he found that the mesocolon was not present in 50 patients. And then from various, either the ascending mesocolon was present or the um, descending mesocolon. And he calculated that 36% of the time there was a left mesocolon and 26% of the time there was a right. And this was very important surgically because abdominal surgery was not undertaken due to its significant risk. And so what would be done was a lumbar colotomy where they would go in through the back and pull out a bit of colon. And he felt that you should really try that on the right because on the left you were more likely to come into problems with mesocolon and bleeding. And this is his drawing of the sigmoid mesentery. Uh, so another famous gentleman around the same time, um, he was Karl Tolt, turn of the century, Austrian anatomist. And he did describe the mesentery, which um, we now believe to be true, that there is a mesentery with the ascending and descending colon. And crucially, that they're separate from the posterior abdominal wall. Uh, Mr. George mentioned that the meson the ascending and descending colon were thought to be retroperitoneal structures. And so it was assumed that the mesentery was from the retroperitoneum and posterior abdominal wall. But he said, no, there is a fascia in between the two, his Tolt's fascia, and we all uh, dissect along the white line of Tolt. Um, but he, his findings were just largely ignored, and it was the findings of Frederick Treves that were mainstay. Uh, and this diagram depicts the two opposite findings. And you see Carl Tolt pretty much had it right. Um, but Treves' explanation stood the test of time. It was in Gray's Anatomy, the book that is, not the TV series, and Last Anatomy and Adam's Anatomy, and it stayed that way really until 2008. And mesocolon, right and left, were thought of as anomalous, sometimes there, sometimes not. Uh, 
Um, so it was up to this gentleman from Limerick to shed light on the um, field and tell us all what the mesentery is. And this is it, essentially. This is his digital representation and schematic. And very interestingly, they analysed data sets from the Visible Human Project, which was a project in which laparoscopic and robotic surgery had a huge influence on, because through laparoscopic and robotic surgery, we had new views of the mesentery that we'd never seen before, new views of fascia. And they basically photographed all of this, correlated it with axial CT images, and also looked at microscopic slides of fascia, of peritoneum, and mesentery, and studied them all together. And their findings are that the mesentery is an extraperitoneal organ. It is continuous from DJ flexure to mesorectum, together with the peritoneum and the fascia. And there are four important confluences, which we could have guessed, but they are ileocecal, rectosigmoid, hepatic, and splenic. And actually, if you stretched out the mesentery, it would be six feet. Um, so I think the ileocecal region was found to be the region with the most dense mesentery, which explains possibly some of the findings in Crohn's disease. Um, and that there is a plane uh, occupied by Tolt's fascia that separates the mesentery from retroperitoneum. And these are just more pictures um, that they've put together to demonstrate that it has a root uh, where the organ begins or arises, and that's at the SMA from the pancreatic bed. And then these pictures show where the mesenteric confluences are. I think the, this is where people thought the mesentery disappeared and was fragmented, but they've shown that it is actually present. Um, and these, this is how they've studied and put together the peritoneum together with fascia showing the mesentery and the colon. The last is just the mesentery as, it's, as it is just one organ. Um, and again, this is best illustrated if you look at the hepatic flexure where all four components can be readily seen. And this is where they got a lot of their um, microscopic analysis from. So if it's an organ, presumably it has a function. And the function, they say, is to suspend the intestines on the posterior abdominal wall, preventing intestines collapsing into the pelvis. It prevents malrotation. Um, and then they have this interesting concept. I think if you're publishing in The Lancet, you should be bold. So they say that the mesentery is the interface between us as humans and the environment. And it is ideally placed to sample the, the environmental milieu, so what we're eating and drinking, what bacteria we're ingesting. And then the mesentery decides what response we should mount in order to what we've consumed, so regulate local and systemic responses by activating all these cells like B cells, T cells, um, that they have in the mesentery. And the mesentery actually produces CRP. Um, so its role in disease, as my colleagues have illustrated, they've defined them as primary mesenteropathies and secondary mesenteropathies. Um, and the mesentery pre presents the largest amount of visceral adiposity. So they suppose it is or could be responsible for obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. Um, what system does the new organ belong to? Take your pick. Uh, it's hematological, it's immunological, endocrine, vascular, and metabolic. Um, so for us colorectal surgeons, we, uh, we've been trained in Bill Heald's holy plane and total mesorectal excision, which revolutionized rectal surgery, made a huge difference to local recurrence rates. And that has all arisen from an anatomical and embryological understanding of planes. And that also standardized rectal surgery so that we could assess pathologically how good our surgery was. But nobody really has taken this on for the colon. I think the focus there has mainly been laparoscopic surgery. But now there has been a surgeons to say, should we be doing total mesocolic excision? And they're doing the exact same thing for the colon. And this sort of mesentery paper contributes to that to demonstrate that it is an uh, important organ and we should be thinking about more drastic um, sort of resection of the mesentery. And so the future, I think, for, for that the paper suggests is that we should be sampling the mesentery, we should be thinking about it more as a prominent organ uh, that does cause disease. Um, so I'll end with a quote from Coffey's paper himself. And thank you all for listening. Thank <laughs> you.